statistics um, and here in Utrecht statistics is in the social sciences so I don't know what all your um, backgrounds are but I hope it's gonna be a bit more generally applicable. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Seabrook group of science but specifically I'm gonna talk about the general topic this is where of quality of science so um, in how do we know that what we're doing in science is actually useful is something good. So what do we do in science? We generally try to get closer to some truth, right? We try to um, model the world around us. We try to um, converge on the truth, say sometimes. So how do we make sure we're not taking a wrong turn somewhere? How do we make sure we're not you know, doing all this research and we really think we're, we're getting closer to the truth, we're digging deeper and deeper into some field, but in the end it doesn't stick out well. Of course, what we would actually like to do in the end is to apply our research. We would like to um, apply science, we would like to get somewhere where we can use the knowledge that we've gotten, apply it, and make sure that it does something nice for us, so that we can interact with the world and that we can make the world better. Well, <clears throat> so generally we can say, how do we make sure that it's valid? Well, we want to make it valid exactly for that, right? We want to make it valid because we want it to be applicable to the real world. So here, just a general definition, the extent to which we, the knowledge that we gather in science is uh, you know, corresponding to the actual real world. So there's, um, this, is, this is something I, I think in all disciplines we really want. And the main thing you can do to make sure that you're doing valid research is to make sure that you do, yeah, this is very general, of course, be a proper researcher. So, for example, if I want to, um, to make sure that people, for example, act more sustainably, then I'm not going to have done a good enough job if I make some method that gets people to uh, have the intention to act more sustainably. Because then I say I'm going to uh, do something about the world, to find something out about the world that um, will make people act more sustainable, but in fact I'm just falling short of that and I'm only doing intent. And there's a lot more in this be a proper researcher, of course. So, so make sure that the research that you're doing actually corresponds. But we also rely on statistics, and of course I'm a statistician, I will not bore you with numbers and oh. formulas. <laughs> um, well, maybe afterwards if you're uh, really interested. Um, but numbers. I will talk... Huh? Numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but I will talk now a bit about what we do in general in statistics, and why I think it's maybe not always far-reaching. So, I'm just going to be very general here. So this is what we tend to see in empirical research scenarios. Um, so we have a question, and the question is, okay, does an effect exist? Does some hypothesis hold true? So this effect can be really anything. It can be, you know, do two groups differ? Uh, can we influence one thing by another? Can we manipulate something? So this is very general. And we're at a crossroads, and we want to choose, okay, are we going to go this way, or are we going to go that way, right? So beforehand, we have no way of choosing between these. So what do we do to, to try to make a decision? Well, we collect data. Right? And this data will tell us something about, well, then it's probably a good idea to go down this way, or it's a good idea to go down this way. So saying yes or no. Oh, OK. But what happens then, or what do we do in statistics? Well, we do this. We try to put chances of making a wrong decision. So what do we then do? We say, OK, we have this data. And given this data, knowing that this is the data that we found, we think it's this likely that if we go down this path, we'll still be making a wrong decision. Because we can never be sure. It's data. It's chance. There's always some 
element of chance. So we can calculate in statistics, and this is what we do all the time. We calculate these chances. The percentage chance, if we say yes, the effect exists given this data, but how, how big is the chance then still of making a wrong decision? And if we go down this way, um, how big is the chance then of having made a wrong decision? So if the data clearly say that there is an effect and we go down the way of saying there's no effect, of course we're very likely to have made a wrong decision, or we'll usually just go in this direction. And this is a very simple scenario where we just say, okay, we want to make a choice between two. And in statistics, most statistical research deals with trying to find ways for more complex models, more complex statistical tools to um, be able to still calculate, okay, what's the, what's the chance of making a wrong decision? And this is what we use to make these decisions. So we usually put a sort of cap on this. Um, usually we say, okay, we don't want, in psychology, for example, we generally say, we don't want to make uh, the wrong decision, if we do say that there is an effect, we want to make the wrong decision in at most 5% of the time. So this is, uh, this is what you do with uh, p-values, or saying a limit to that. that. That is all. We're trying to put a cap on, okay, I don't want to make too many wrong decisions. So what's wrong with this, then, is the question, right? Why, um, and like these chances, they're, they're mathematical. It's not, you know, this is something we know as statisticians. We can calculate these chances. So there's, there's nothing really wrong with that. But the problem that I have, at least, with this scenario, with this way of thinking, is that it's, it's pretty limited. Before I was talking about you know, having a valid scientific discipline, having all the studies in your field being um, valid, going to some place that is close to the truth. But that d this doesn't say anything about that. It says something about those single studies within the discipline, right? So, that's where I think it, it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, short-sighted in a sense. Um, so there's more than just the one study. Uh, to illustrate this, I have some examples of things that pop up, and one is, for example, publication bias. So researchers can only easily publish results that have positive uh, results, usually, right? They can only show that something new is happening, something innovative is happening. And if their research doesn't work out that well, it's interesting information, but not for researchers at large. We're saying, okay, we don't have time to read everything, and it's just thrown away usually. And this is a big problem because it, it means that if uh, that there's a much bigger chance of reading about effects that are, um, so if you go back here, if we, uh, if we have a wrong decision here, well, so we, we think there's an effect and there is none, well, then we're still going to publish that. So that's going to be more likely to be published than all those results that have failed. So we'll still have much more than the 5% maximum that we want, 5% uh, maximum wrong decisions that we would like in the published field. Right? Then we have things uh, they sometimes call phantom fields or something like that, where a new effect is found, for example, one that is, uh, so maybe one that doesn't hold true, actually, so we make a wrong decision, we say, yes, there's a very nice, interesting new effect, and all kinds of researchers start to spring up, and start to do replications on this study. This, this you see a lot, for example, in psychology as well, um, where you know someone finds some interesting phenomena, it makes common sense, it's interesting, um, you can also think, for example, of the papers uh, written by Stapel, which were wrong, but they were very interesting. They, they provoked people, and people got really excited and riled up. Right? So then everyone starts doing research in these fields and starts trying to find effects, but only the ones that, once again, only the ones that find large effects, that find positive results, are published. So then a sort of field pops up that has no relation to the truth, but it's just, you know, working with itself, working within this field. People are flying all over the world to meet other top shots in this field. And in fact, there's nothing happening. It's all based on 
this um, one study, but we don't know about the ones that don't get published. So, but there's much more going on. For example, researchers have a lot of reason to not um, to sort of push their studies in one direction. They usually have a strong personal belief that what they are studying is true, because otherwise they've spent so much time into it. They've sunk, sink, sank. They've sank so much time into it. They really wanted to uh, find this effect over and over again, and they're not easily going to say, "Well, it doesn't exist." Right? In grant applications, you can see a similar thing where people are forced to say, "Yeah, this is a really interesting area. This really is." So there's a lot of um, incentivization that doesn't necessarily follow this neutral stance that we would like scientists to have, right? And the pure idealistic view of science, we're saying, okay, we're going to look at the world and describe it. And we're going to take no part in it and just, you know, observe and, and, and talk about it. And, but it doesn't work like that. There's a huge stake of the research itself to find significant results. And then, of course, you get things like fraud or what they call questionable research practices, which is um, trying to only slightly um, make sure that your research is a bit more likely to find the effects which you have believe in that they are there. So you don't find them so uh, appalling, even though they do, uh, they are not necessarily good research. Some examples are, um, so collecting more data after you see that your results are not significant, so that you don't find positive results, and you go ahead and try to find more data to make sure you find it anyway. Or the opposite, seeing that you have some positive results and just going ahead with it and not finding more data that could later invalidate your uh, results. Um, people are rounding off p-values, so really um, all kinds of this. And this is actually from a, a study that asked uh, self-admission rate for these questionable research practices. And you see a lot of people are doing things like this. So over half is uh, deciding whether to collect more data after looking to see whether the results are positive. And that's something that really does mess up your <coughs> research. Uh, so what does it mess up? Well, if we go back to this, it messes up this, right? You get the wrong decision much more often because all of the above, all of the, the earlier effects, um, so all of these and all of these questionable research practices, they all increase this chance. They all make it more likely for you to find the effect which you already believe that exists, and it's more likely to make a wrong decision here. So what I'm trying to say is we, in statistics, what my discipline does, we look at this uh, one study and calculate how it works, but we're not able to fully grasp the environment in which the study is being done. We're not being able to take into account, you know, these, these uh, fraud cases or uh, all these research practices or all these um, stakes that a researcher might have in this, this study. And so we don't get to the bottom of what's actually happening in, our, happening in our scientific discipline, right? Because um, we, we focus on research validity, but we just assume everything else is going well. So the researcher is not uh, having a stake in it, et cetera. So, and they're not, for example, trying to, to sort of game the system. And that's really what, what, what is happening in a lot of cases. Like researchers gaming the system because they have such a strong pressure to, to perform. So these broader issues uh, that I talked about, they're generally either overlooked or they all are talked about something like publication bias. Of course, it's, it's well known. Uh, and there are a lot of um, initiatives as well that try to do something about these. And I think they're, they're all perfectly valid and they're all great. But, um, and it's great that we can address these, but we need actually to have some sort of feedback me mechanism that shows us how valid our research then is. Not within one study, like I talked about, but more broadly, right? How, how valid is our research discipline? How valid is it all? Well, so how do we do that? That's, that's an, actually a very difficult question because if you want to know whether your research is valid, if you want to know whether the whole discipline is valid, we define it as being 
corresponding to the truth, right? So we cannot really know the truth, otherwise we wouldn't be having this whole science discussion anyway. So if we want to know whether our research is valid, we must know the truth. So, well, what can we do then? Well, there's something you could do, and that's sort of taking the opposite direction. Where you would start, hypothetically, a new scientific field, and I don't mean like a field at large, I just mean like a small discipline, a small subfield, a small subdiscipline of some, some area, um, where the, the truth is always the same. The truth is always that there's no actual effect, and the sciences and the field behave the exact way that they would normally, right? So, what uh, do you get then? They, the scientists definitely believe that the effect they're looking for exists. They only publish their positive results. They're under a lot of pressure. All the same things that I talked about before. So the whole way scientific world works would need to be in this new scientific field to make sure that we have a sort of control group, really. It's sort of like a placebo, where in a placebo situation, you really believe that what you're having is an effect, that what you're having is a result, and that you're looking at the real thing. Well, in fact, there's actually nothing going on, right? And you would, you would really like to get um, something like that, but of course this isn't really realistic. Because starting up a new scientific field, well, if we had a lot of money, it would maybe be possible, but also making sure that the scientists behave exactly as in other fields, so that's going to be very, very difficult, right? Well, actually, I believe that there was one thing that comes very, very close to this. And um, I, I uh, had been thinking about this part for a long time. But then I read a blog post that actually was talking about parapsychology. And I, I had, it hadn't really occurred to me to read scientific articles on this, because I generally just dismiss something as weird as parapsychology. But it actually, I think, I would argue that it fits the bill quite well to what I was talking before as a sort of control group for science. Because what they study in parapsychology is what, what I will generally call psi, which is all kinds of uh, psionic abilities that they assume humans have. So, for example, uh, prediction of future events, uh, you can think of mind reading, stuff like that, right? And that's, this is actually a big discipline. Like, there's a lot of papers being published, there's journals, there's subfields, there's, there's conferences, they have everything. However, it, it probably doesn't exist. I'm just gonna put that out there. Because, well, it, it conflicts with science in a much broader sense than the, than the people who are in the discipline are trying to think of, right? I mean, it conflicts with physics in, in many ways, and it conflicts with, with a lot of what we're used to. There's almost no evidence that this knowledge can actually, if, I talk, if we talk about what I talked about, but at the very beginning, to be able to apply science in a useful situation, I, re I really see that as a sort of the, the end of uh, science, in a sense. To apply this sort of parapsychology in a useful setting, that really, there's really be no more than anecdotal evidence for something like that, and there's no strong case that will say, okay, this sort of phenomena uh, really seems to exist. Uh, a good example is, is uh, an experiment by uh, Wiseman and Schlitz, which I really like. Um, Richard Wiseman is a, is a psi um, critic. He's been criticizing it for a while, and he, he's always saying, okay, yeah, what are you guys doing? It really doesn't exist. He showed it in several experiments, but of course the discipline just goes on, because they also show that it does exist. And he got into contact with uh, a person named Schlitz, who has actually did a lot of research in proving uh, psi, and they did an experiment together. And it was actually it was a very nice uh, experiment. They had set it up so that they both chose all the study materials. They completely worked together. They were both involved thoroughly in all parts of the process. And then they did the experiment um, on alternating days throughout the week in the same lab. So one day Richard Weisman was there, the other day Schlitz was there, um, excuse me. Um, and they would alternate this. So, what I guess they would find in the end, well, Richard Wiseman found in all cases that the psi effect did not exist. Schlitz found it in all cases that it did exist. So, 
now they've, they've, they've both really wanted to work together. They've tried to you know, make it all as equal as possible, but in the end, it seems like they both are going to end up at different conclusions anyway, even within the same uh, area, within the same, with the same tools. And it's actually it's, it's a pretty funny paper to read because at the end, for example, the, the two writers of the article um, accuse each other sort of of um, meddling with the computer results. They basically say, well, it could also be that the other author has uh, changed the data because they want their belief to be found valid. And, you know, this is the sort of mud throwing we're, we're arriving at, I guess. So, the study of sign. There's a huge scientific field doing research into, into this sort of thing. And it seems um, to me that if we're going to look at a sort of control group, a scientific discipline where nothing is really happening, this has got to be it. Um, so what we can then do is we can just look at this, this discipline. We can look at these people and we can see how do they conduct research. They must be, um, they must be very bad researchers, right? They must be the, the really sloppy, and they must be doing you know, all the, the terrible research. They must be all, doing all the questionable research practices. Um, there's, a, there's a meta analysis by Ben that um, you, can, uh, you can look it up. It, it actually ticks pretty much all of the boxes for what we would generally consider to be good research practices. And it's, it's pretty surprising, actually. And in the end, so Ben, he does a meta-analysis. He, he gathers many studies. He looks at all kinds of studies and compares them and tries to see which find an effect and which don't. He does a lot of exact replications, which will always say that we want more of in science. They have really big sample sizes, so it seems to be working. Uh, so they, it shouldn't be just chance. That seems very unlikely. There is really sophisticated methods, so it's not that they're doing the wrong tests or anything. They have really strict criteria, and they have experimental research instead of just correlational research, and all these things, he finds that the side effect still exists. So this is really not what I wanted to read when I read the article, because I figured, well, if he's doing all this good research, why am I advocating for such good research if it doesn't even help um, show that a, a non-existent effect is, is not there, right? Why, why does this effect still persist? And I think for the answer, you really have to think about what I was saying earlier. I think there's this whole area, this whole place where, where there's much more going on in scientific communication, in researchers having their own personal stake in it, that um, it's actually, I would still argue that, that the psi thing does not exist. So I would say don't start believing us, I really, because I, um, it, it still seems really unlikely to me. I think what we should do instead is to stop believing in how infallible these scientific methods are. I think we should take into account the fact that we have this, this thing such as publication bias and all these things that are surrounding our research and use that and sort of strive towards that rather than just look within one scientific field, one small uh, field, uh, one study, for example, and to only within that look for how likely is it that we're making the decision. <coughs> so, yeah, that's, that's really what I would advocate, is to look at disciplines more broadly. However, of course, that's, that's pretty complicated. Um, so, I think, um, yeah, as I was saying, I would like to really investigate, you know, the way science is conducted in general, beyond just the single study. So yeah, what I, what I was thinking about doing now, I'm I'm actually really interested, and I would like to do some more research into this, uh, maybe later besides other research within statistics that I am doing. Uh, but maybe we could um, investigate how multiple studies, in an effect, run and how that will work. Or uh, Actually, uh, a talk was here rec recently by uh, Jonas Wolterschoff, and I got pretty inspired by his uh, use of actor-based methods, which is basically you simulate people, right? You could, in this case, for example, simulate scientists, and you could uh, try to have them act 
as scientists do and try to see what happens if you play. And that's especially what's the most interesting thing. Like, what happens if you just play with some of the parameters? What, what happens if you slightly reduce publication bias? Does that help? How often do uh, wrong effects still spawn entire new fields? And yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm really interested in looking at later. Um, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, I really hope it was sort of clear to everyone and I didn't like, confuse everyone with all my talk about statistics. And, uh, yeah. right.